Welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm Dave Nicholson, and today we have a very special guest from Red Hat, Nick Barsett. Nick is the Senior Director of Technology, uh, Technology Strategy at Red Hat. Nick, welcome back to the CUBE. Thank you. Uh, it's a, always a pleasure to be visiting you, even it's, virtually. It's fantastic to have you here. I see uh, new office surroundings at Red Hat. Have they uh, have they have they taken a kind of a nautical theme at the office there? Where where where, where are you joining us from? I'm joining from my boat. You know, I've been living on my boat for the past three years, and uh, that's where you'll find me most of the time. So, so would you consider your boat to be on the edge? It's certainly one form of edge. You know, there are multiple forms of edge, and a boat is one of those forms. Well, let's talk about edge now. We're 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 having this conversation in anticipation of uh, KubeCon Cloud Native Con that's coming up, uh, the North America 2021 coming up in Los Angeles. Um, let's talk about specifically the edge, where ed, where, where where the edge, edge computing, and Kubernetes come together. Uh, from a Red Hat perspective. Walk, walk us through that. Talk about some of the challenges that people are having at the edge, why Kubernetes is something that would be considered at the edge. Walk us through that. So let's start from the premises that people have been doing stuff at the edge for ages. I mean, nobody has been waiting for Kubernetes or any other technology to start uh, implementing some form of computing that is happening in their stores, in their factories, wherever. What's really new today is when we talk about edge computing, it's reusing the same technology we've been using to deploy inside of the data center and expand that all the way to the edge. And that's what, from my perspective, constitutes edge computing or the revolution it brings. So that means that the same GitOps, DevSecOps methodology that we were using in the data center are now expandable all the way to those devices that live in weird locations. And that we can reuse the same methodology, the same tooling, and that includes Kubernetes. And all the efforts we've been doing over the, the past couple of years has been to uh, make Kubernetes even more accessible for the various edge topologies that we are encountering when discussing with our customer that have edge projects. So typically when we think of a Kubernetes environment, you're talking about uh, containers that are contained in pods that live on physical clusters. Uh, despite all of the talk of uh, no code and serverless, we still live in a world where applications and microservices run on physical servers. Um, what are, are there practical limitations in terms of just how small you can scale Kubernetes? How far, how how close to the edge can you get uh, with a Kubernetes deployment? So in theory, there is really no limit as the smallest devices are always bigger than Kubernetes itself. But the reality is you never use just Kubernetes. You use Kubernetes with a, a series of other projects that makes it uh, uh, complete. Uh, for example, stuff that is going to be reporting telemetry, uh, components that are going to help you uh, automatically scale, etc. And the further you go into the edge, the less of these components you can afford. So you have to make trade-offs uh, when you reduce the size of the device. Uh, today, what Red Hat offers is really concentrated to where we can deliver a full OpenShift experience. So the smallest uh, environment on which we would recommend to run OpenShift at the edge is a single node with roughly 24 gigabits of RAM, uh, which is gigabytes, sorry, uh, which is uh, already a, a relatively big edge device. And when you go a step lower, then that's where we would recommend using uh, a standard rail for edge configuration or something similar, not Kubernetes anymore. So, so you 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 said single node. Are you are you? Let's let's double click on that for a second. Is that a single physical node that is abstracted in a way to create some level of logical redundancy? What do you, when you say single node, 
Walk us through that. We've got containers that are in pods. So physically, so, what are we talking so about? You have, uh, based on your requirement, you can have different way of addressing your compute need at the edge. You can have the smallest of clusters, and this would be three nodes that are delivered with the control plane and the worker node integrated into one. Uh, when you want to go a step further, you could uh, use worker nodes that are controlled remotely via a central control plane that is uh, at a central site. And when you want to go even one step further, deploy Kubernetes on a very small machine, but that remains fully functional even if disconnected. That's when you would use this thing that is not anymore a cluster, which is a single node Kubernetes where you still have access to the full Kubernetes API, regardless of the connectivity of your site, whether it's active or not, whether you're at sea or in the air or not. And that's where we still offer some form of software high availability because Kubernetes, even on a single node, we'll still detect if a container dies and restart it and provide similar uh, functionality like this, but it won't provide hardware availability since we are with a single node. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. sense. No, that makes yeah, it makes perfect sense. And uh, I, I would suggest that we refer to that as a single node cluster, just because we like to mix it up with uh, terminology in our business and sometimes confuse people with it. So, so let's exactly so the opposite choice we made, actually. <laughs> not to call it a cluster because it's not. Exactly. A cluster is not a cluster. Exactly. No, I, I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, so let's be explicit about what the trade-offs are there. Let's say that I'm thinking of deploying something at the edge and I'm going to use Kubernetes to orchestrate my container environment uh, and pretend for a moment that space and cost aren't huge limiting factors. I could put a three node cluster in, but the idea of putting in a single node is very is attractive. Um, where where does where is where is the line drawn in terms of what you would recommend uh, from you know what are, what are the trade offs? What am I losing going to the single node cluster? See, I just called well, it. A what, in a nutshell, I, in a nutshell, you're losing hardware I availability. Meaning, if one of your server fails, since you only have one server, you lose everything, and there is no way around that. That's the biggest trade-off. Then you have also a trade-off on uh, the memory used by the control plane, which you won't be able to use to do something else. So if I have a site with excellent connectivity and the biggest loss uh, of connectivity might be counted in hours, maybe a remote worker is a better solution because this way I, uh, uh, I have a single central side that carries my control plane and I can use all the RAM and all the CPUs on my local site uh, to deploy my workloads, not to, car to carry the control plane. To give you an example of, of this trade-off uh, in the telco space, for example, if you're deploying uh, an antenna in a city, you have plenty of antennas covering that city and therefore the loss of one antenna is not a big deal. So in that case, you will be tempted to use a remote worker because you will be maximizing your use of the RAM on the sites for the workload, which is let's have people establish communication using their phones. But now we take another antenna that we are going to locate in a very remote location. There, if this antenna fail, everybody fails. There is nobody that is able to make calls. Even emergency uh, vehicle cannot discuss together very often. So in that case, it's a lot better to have an autonomous deployment, something where the control plane and the, uh, the workload itself are being run in one box. And this one box, in fact, can be duplicated there could be a, another box that is either sitting in a truck 
in case of emergency or off but on the antenna site so that in case of a major failure you have a possibility to, re to restore it so it really depends on what your uh, sets of constraints in terms of availability in some of efficiency of your ram use is going to be that is going to make you choose between uh, one or the other of the deployment models no that's, that's a great example and so it sounds like it's not a one size fits all world obviously um, now from the perspective of the marketplace looking in at red hat participating in this in this business um, some think of red hat as the company that deployed linux 20 years ago uh, help us make that connection between red hat today and what you've been doing for the last 20 years and this and this topic of edge computing because some people don't automatically think of red hat and edge computing uh, so, I do. I think they should, <laughs> but but help us understand that. Yeah, obviously, a, a lot of people consider that Red Hat is Red Hat Linux, uh, and that's it. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is what we've been uh, known since uh, the big, our beginnings 25 years ago, and what has made our early success. But we consider ourselves more of an infrastructure company. We have been offering for the past. 20 years, the various components that you need to deploy server, run and manage your workloads across uh, data centers and uh, make sure that you can store your data and that you can automate your operations uh, on top of this infrastructure. So we, we really consider ourselves much more of a company that offers everything that enables you to run your servers and run your workloads on top of your server. And that uh, includes a tool to do virtualization, that includes tool to uh, do container uh, deployment of containers. And that's where Kubernetes entered uh, in play about 10 years ago. Well, first uh, it was a, a pass that then became Kubernetes and uh, the OpenShift offering that we have today. Yeah, thanks for that. Um... So I have, uh, I've got a final question for you. That's a little bit off topic, but it's related. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is in the category of Nick predicts. So when does Nick predict that we will get to a point where we tip beyond the 50-50 point, cloud versus on-premises IT spending? If you accept today that we're still in the neighborhood of 75 to 80% on-premises. When will we hit the 50-50 mark? I'm not, I'm not asking you for the 100% cloud date, but uh, give us a date. You give us a month and a year for 50-50. Given the progression of uh, cloud, if there was no edge, we could say two to three years from now, uh, we would be at this 50-50 mark. But the funny thing is that at the same time as the cloud progresses, people start realizing that they have needs that needs to be solved locally. And this is why we are deploying edge-based solution, a uh, solution which reliably can provide answers regardless of the connectivity to the cloud, regardless of the bandwidth. Um, there are things that I would never want to do, like feeding a thousand feeds from 4K cameras into my cloud uh, environment that that won't scale uh, i won't have the bandwidth to do so and therefore uh maybe the answer to your question is it's going to be asymptotic and it's almost impossible to predict so that is a much better answer than giving me an exact date and time because <laughs> because it reveals exactly the reality that we're living in again there is you know it's it's uh it's it's fit for function uh, it's not cloud for cloud's sake. Uh, uh, compute resources, uh, data resources have a place that they naturally belong oftentimes. And, uh, and, and oftentimes that is on the edge, whether it's on the edge of, uh, the, edge of the world in a sailboat or, uh, or out in a single server, not node. <laughs> or so, I, I, keep, I keep wanting to say single node cluster, it's killing me. Uh, I don't know why I think it's so funny. But uh, but a, but a a, um, a single node implementation of OpenShift 
uh, where you can run Kubernetes on the edge. Uh, it's a fascinating subject. Anything else that you want to share with us that we didn't well, hit? I think one aspect that uh, we never talk enough is how do you manage uh, at the scale of edge? Because even though each edge site is very small, you can have thousands, even uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of these uh, single node something that are running all over the place. And I think that what you're seeing in uh, advanced cluster management for Kubernetes, uh, and particularly the 2.4 version that we are going to uh, be announcing uh, this week and uh, actually releasing in November, uh, is I think a pretty good answer to that problem on how do I deploy with uh, zero touch uh, these devices? How do I update them, upgrade them? How do I deploy the, the workloads on top of them? How do I ensure to have the right tooling to uh, deploy that at the scale? And we've done the testing uh, now of ACM uh, with uh, up to 2,000 clusters connected to a single ACM instance. And in the future, we are planning on building federation uh, of those, um, which really gives us the possibility to uh, provide the tooling needed to manage at this scale. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's uh, whenever we start talking about anything in the realm of uh, containerization and Kubernetes, scale starts to become an issue. It's no longer a question of a human being managing 10 servers and 50 applications. We start talking about tens of thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of instances where it's beyond human scale. So uh, that's obviously something that's very, very important. Uh, well, Nick, I wanna thank you for becoming a CUBE veteran once again. Uh, thanks for joining this CUBE conversation. Uh, from Dave Nicholson, this has been a CUBE conversation in anticipation of CubeCon and CloudNativeCon, North America 2021. Thanks for tuning in.